Can I welcome everybody to the 31st meeting of the Education and Culture Committee in 2015 and can I remind all those present that all electronic devices should be switched off at all times. Um, we have a full committee um, here this morning and can I also welcome Liz Smith um, who's joined us again this morning uh, for the stage two of the Education Scotland Bill. Our first item is to agree to take item five in private. Are we all agreed? Yes. That's agreed. Uh, our second item today is the, the Stage 2 consideration of the Education Scotland Bill, and which we will complete. Can I welcome Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning and our accompanying officials. The committee, of course, met yesterday in Dunfermline when we concluded by agreeing Section 19. Um, therefore, um, can I call Amendment 172 in the name of Liam MacArthur in a group on its own. Liam MacArthur to move and speak to Amendment 172. Thanks. Convener, after the complexities of my amendments last week, I'm uh, pleased to say that uh, I found myself in the position this time round of dealing with a rather more uh, simple fare. Um, though, as with the early attempt to get the government to back away from its, I think, ill-thought-out proposals for national standardised testing, my amendment 172, which I have pleasure in moving, is aimed at removing a provision that seems to me unnecessary, uh, disproportionate and misplaced. Parliament should only seek to legislate where it uh, has to, where there is a demonstrable need and where other less blunt and or draconian options have been explored and found wanting. Sadly, the approach of ministers currently is to reach for the legislative lever at the drop of a hat, a bad news headline or a demand from one well-organised or well-connected organisation or another is often all that it takes. I do not dispute the importance of councils having access to appropriate advice and expertise when it comes to education. That goes without saying, given their responsibility in this area, though as we saw yesterday, ministers appear to have an insatiable appetite to now second guess more and more of what it is that our councils do. The Association of Directors of uh, Education, of course, made the case for making the appo appointment of Chief Education Officer a statutory requirement. This, though, is a little akin to Santa's voting for Christmas, uh, and it was telling that no hard evidence was provided for why such a move is necessary. The argument that reorganisation within local government and the merging of education within larger departments with wider responsibility is interesting but not compelling. In order to carry out the functions for which it is responsible, any council will need to ensure that it has access to the requisite advice and expertise. In the same way, I presume, as the Scottish Government does when it goes through periodic reorganisation uh, of its departments. Ministers never tire of telling us about how they have removed the ring fencing from large areas of government funding, local government funding. Yet they seem determined to ring fence the organisational chart in councils across Scotland, stipulating who should have what roles and what responsibilities. Convener, this amendment would remove another part of the bill for which there is little or no supporting evidence and give us some reassurance that we are not simply legislating for the sake of it. And I have pleasure in moving Amendment 172, my name. Thank you very much, Liam. Um, other members who wish to contribute to this debate, um, can I call Mary Scanlon? Yes, I, th I think it's very important um, that uh, we're given the information about uh, where this idea came from, or perhaps we should be asking who it came from and whether it was more than one person and uh, what sort of consultation was done. Uh, I think the second thing that I would like to know when the Cabinet Secretary responds is what is the evidence base? Is there a link... Uh, between the appointment of a chief education officer and attainment. Um, you know, we're being asked to make a decision today. Uh, there is a very limited evidence base for it. Uh, my third point um, comes back to local democracy. You know, in the Highlands, they do elect uh, 80 councillors. And if I've learned one thing since May 99, it's that you don't go and tell the councillors how to do their job. Uh, and I think they equally respect the job that we have to do. Uh, I think this uh, uh, appointment, this uh, Amendment 78, usurps local democracy. I think it's disrespectful to local democracy. And I will say that Highland Council is one of the councils where there is a, a director in the name of Bill Alexander, who is the director of uh, care, uh, social care and indeed learning. And I'll repeat one thing that I said yesterday. 
I get plenty of complaints about Highland Council, whether it's wind turbines, planning or housing. And I've never, ever had a complaint that Bill Alexander's not doing his job right, despite the fact that he is also the equivalent of Director of Social Work and Director of uh, Education. Uh, in fact, um, I fully respect the decision by Highland Council uh, to appoint him to that job. Uh, I, and I do think that uh, we need to be a little bit more courteous a little bit more democratic and respectful to those who are uh, elected locally. And uh, I think this is just another uh, issue where local government are thinking, well, <laughs> you know, why are we constantly being dictated to? Why can't we make the decisions about the cabinet-type system of running local government, which is appropriate to their areas, rather than, than being told by Edinburgh what to do? So um, I would be grateful if I could uh, get the information that I'm asking, convener. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Mary. Um, can I call George Adam? Convener, I come at this from a very specific view of being actually from local government at one point. And I can see uh, why this, uh, there is a need for this role, because I have seen how departments have been merged, and I think it is quite important that we take that on board, because obviously when social work budgets, uh, with the change in social and, social and health care, when that, the integration happened, that took away quite a bit of the budget, so councils automatically merge departments and you end up with a children's, a homogenous children's department almost. Now, in some places, that may be a director who comes from a social work background, it may be a director that comes from an education background that's in charge of that. But for me, the important thing is that you yeah, still have a chief education officer, because someone needs to be there from the educational, be an educationalist and from that background. And I think it's important that they still have that individual within the local authority, because having one worked in a local authority, I can see how these things can happen and how debate uh, happens within the authorities. And for me, it's always good to have someone here. We have it with social work already. They're already as a chief, and that's extremely important as well. So I think from this perspective, it's following on from other uh, ideas that are already there and other guaranteed officers. And I, as someone who worked in local authority and uh, was uh, a councillor, I think this is good for local government. I think it's a positive step, and I think it's a way forward for education in local government. Thank you very much. If no other members wish to contribute, okay, can I call the Cabinet Secretary? Okay, thank you, Convener. Uh, it comes as no surprise that Mr MacArthur should lodge uh, this amendment, uh, given his uh, contribution to the Committee's scrutiny of the Bill at Stage 1 uh, and at the Stage 1 debate. Um, equally, it will come as no surprise to Committee members that uh, I reject this amendment entirely. Uh, this Government has made absolutely clear that education is our key priority. We are committed to raising attainment for all uh, and to reducing inequalities of outcome. And I very much welcome uh, the Committee's support for the establishment of the Chief Education Officer role uh, in its Stage 1 report. And I welcome the Committee's uh, recommendation and recognition uh, of the importance and complexity of Council educational functions. Councils spent £4.8 billion on education uh, in 2013-14. That's nearly 44% of their total net expenditure. Uh, it has to be right that the, the voice of education is guaranteed to be heard in discussions about the use of such significant amounts of money. Communities in every local authority deserve the assurance that their education services are being run by those with high quality educational uh, expertise. And I note that Mr MacArthur and other members suggest that there is no problem uh, to solve, but uh, already we have seen uh, many directors of education posts removed as councils have reorganised and moved towards shared services. That in itself uh, is not necessarily difficult uh, if you uh, continue to have uh, educational expertise at a senior management level. And it is true uh, that we are not uh, yet facing a widespread problem. Uh, the vast majority of councils will be able to identify someone from within their existing structures who meets uh, the statutory requirements of the post. 
But surely it is preferable to act now to, to safeguard the future presence of appropriately qualified and experienced educationalists in local authority senior management teams than to, to wait for some more significant problem uh, to arrive at some point in the future. And the government is not looking to micromanage councils. The bill provisions are not about forcing local authorities to have a chief education officer in overall charge uh, of the education service. Uh, nor will they prevent councils from uh, moving to a model of shared service delivery, uh, whether within or across councils, should they so wish. Uh, they will simply ensure both now and in the future that there is someone uh, with an education background at senior level uh, in councils. And of course, there are parallels, of some, as some members have mentioned, with chief social work officers, uh, chief planning officers, uh, and chief uh, finance officers. And can I say to to Mary Scanlon uh, that the government has certainly had representations uh, for the Association of Directors of Education in Scotland and that no one can seriously argue that having fewer educationalists involved in education services uh, is uh, a good thing. Um, let me finish, convener, uh, by clarifying for Mr MacArthur and others what the role of the Chief Education Officer will be. Uh, while the, the bill provisions make clear that the role is an advisory one, it is important to understand the nature of that advice. The Chief Education Officer is not offering well-intentioned suggestions for the authority to take or leave as it wishes. The advice provided will ensure that the authority has the necessary knowledge and understanding to deliver its statutory functions effectively and with the best interests of children and young people eh, at their heart. There will, of course, be a full consultation eh, on draft eh, regulations. Eh, the working group has met eh, on two occasions now and have, have agreed an outline eh, of the guidance eh, and have begun to discuss eh, the qualifications eh, necessary eh, for the Chief Education Officer eh, role. Uh, so my argument, convener, is the role of Chief Education Officer is unarguably uh, a crucial one, and I do not support Amendment 172 uh, and ask that Mr MacArthur withdraw it. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call on Liam MacArthur to wind up the debate and indicate whether he wishes to press or withdraw his amendment? Okay. Thank you, uh, convener. Can I start by thanking uh, Mary Scanlon, George Adam and the Minister for... Uh, their contribution to the discussion. I think Mary Scanlon um, set out some fairly reasonable questions in terms of the genesis of the, the proposal, the consultation that had taken place, the evidence on which it is, is based, and I think crucially also the issue of local democracy. I noted um, that the Minister, in, in her comments, um, yes, said it was no surprise, um, but uh, that this was born of the government's commitment to putting education as its number one priority. But I don't think there's any evidence to suggest that the proposal um, being brought forward under the new Section 78 um, is a requirement in order to deliver uh, on that priority or indeed to enclose the uh, attainment gap. It seems to me to be the creation of a straw man. It appears to be discourteous, disrespectful and slightly disingenuous uh, about the priority to which um, uh, local authorities uh, attached to uh, the delivery of uh, education. Uh, yes, there has been restructuring within uh, local councils, uh, but I think access to um, ex uh, expertise in terms of education is still something that uh, councils will take um, with the utmost uh, seriousness. We heard also that the role is advisory, but somehow more than uh, advisory. This was something that uh, in the evidence at stage one uh, was, uh, was far from clear. And again, I think the, the, the Cabinet Secretary has reiterated uh, that this is uh, an advisory role, but more than advisory, which I, I think begs the question uh, what precisely is envisaged. George Adam told us about uh, his background in, in local government, and I, I certainly bow to that. Uh, I would be interested to know the views of those elected members and officials in the council that uh, George Adam is no longer a member uh, in relation to the provision uh, that's been brought forward in the new section 78. And I rather suspect that George Adam would have taken a different vote, uh, view on this matter uh, were he still a councillor himself. I think um, the, the, the fact is that second-guessing at every turn what it is that councils do, rather than 
giving them the, the, the respect uh, and the licence to act in the uh, ways that they see fit, given their statutory requirements and their democratic accountability to those uh, who elect them uh, and those they are there to serve, um, I think is, is a dangerous path to go down. And therefore, um, I will uh, be moving my amendment 172. So you're, you're pressing your I'm amendment? I'm pressing the amendment, sorry. Yeah. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr MacArthur. The question is that amendment 172 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Yes. We're not all agreed, therefore there shall be a division. Uh, would those members who wish to support Amendment 172 please vote now? Thank you. Those against? Thank you. Uh, the result of the division on Amendment 172, two votes in favour and seven votes against. Uh, amendment 172 was not agreed to. The question is that sections 21 and 22 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We are agreed. Can I call Amendment 133 in the name of the Cabinet Secretary, grouped with Amendments 135, 136, 137, 138 and 139. Cabinet Secretary to move Amendment 133 and speak to all amendments in the group. Cabinet Secretary. Thank you. I think it's important, Convener, to state that this policy is not new. Ensuring head teachers are qualified before being appointed has been the long-term goal of government since 2005. Since then, local authorities have been expected to appoint qualified head teachers and Teaching Scotland's Future, the establishment of S Scottish College for Educational Leadership and the new qualification itself it has laid ground uh, for this change. This government is acutely aware of the importance of head teachers to the success of our education system. That's why the First Minister announced in February this year that holding a qualification would become mandatory uh, for all new head teachers from 2018-19. That's why school leadership is one of the six drivers for improvement set out in the National Improvement Framework. And the time is now right to underpin these expectations with a legal requirement uh, that all prospective head teachers in any school uh, must have been awarded the standard for headship before being appointed. I have considered the evidence presented to committee in advance of stage two. I understand the concerns over recruitment and will continue to work with ADES to better understand why the number of candidates for some head teacher posts is low. I do, however, believe that a, a clear, high quality and supportive route to headship will make the post more attractive and will help to address recruitment issues. I am also committed to revisiting the funding model for the qualification after the spending review and will look to establish a sustainable approach uh, that employers, teachers and providers of learning uh, are able to support. I also acknowledge the points raised by the independent and grant aided schools and would like to reassure these schools that we will work closely with them to ensure that the regulations and associated qualifications take account of their circumstances. Fundamentally, I believe that every child in Scotland has the right to expect to be educated in a school with a head teacher with the appropriate knowledge and skills to help them succeed and to allow that school to, to flourish. And it is right that we legislate for, for that ambition so we can all be clear in those expectations. There are practical considerations that have been raised in evidence and we will continue to work with partners including the General Teaching Council for Scotland and the Scottish Council for Independent Schools to find ways to address these. One issue that uh, we will consider urgently is how to ensure that teachers coming from outside Scotland who can demonstrate that they have equivalent education qualifications and experience uh, do not have to undertake uh, additional study to work here. Moreover, uh, members will note that any future regulations addressing such practical matters will be subject to full consultation and the affirmative procedure in Parliament, ensuring appropriate scrutiny and enabling them to satisfy themselves of the detail of this important subject. Amendment 139 simply amends the long title of the Bill to reflect the inclusion uh, of the new powers relating to the education and training standards of head teachers. Amendment 135 to 138 makes some minor drafting amendments to ensure the long title reads properly with the additional text in Amendment 139. Uh, so, convener, I move Amendment 133 and ask members to support all the amendments in this group. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Can I call Liam MacArthur? Thank you, convener. Just to 
probably more a couple of questions rather than anything else. I noticed in relation to um, the requirement uh, that this now be mandatory, that the Cabinet Secretary, uh, I think, rather candidly acknowledged the concerns that have been raised with us about current problems in recruitment of, of headships. I certainly uh, know that that is a, a problem in, in many rural areas, but I don't suppose that it's limited uh, to rural areas uh, by any means. Um, and therefore, I think anything that makes it more difficult um, to, to recruit is obviously a source of concern. She's offered a commitment um, to work with uh, Addis and others to establish what the, the, the reasons are behind that recruitment difficulty. But I can't help but contrast the approach, not that the, the, the Cabinet Secretary, but one of her ministers took in relation to the BSL bill, when we were raising concerns about an unwillingness or, or the relatively low level of standards required of BSL uh, teachers uh, to be told, I think by officials rather than, than the minister, uh, to be fair, um, that they weren't inclined to, to uh, do anything about that for the time being because of the recruitment um, uh, problems that that would, uh, that would uh, that contribute to. Um, I, I think in relation to the, the independent sector, I noticed that in, in um, uh, subparagraph 98DA, there's specific reference to the, the, the uh, head teachers in the independent uh, sector. The Cabinet Secretary will be aware of the concerns that were raised with us by, by John Edward at SCIS. Um, that there had been no consultation with them at all about uh, the standard for headship and the application in the, uh, I I I for independent schools. Um, and I think following on from that, a, a concern that what had been worked up didn't appear to have much, if any, relevance to the sorts of uh, skill sets and, and, and requirements uh, that their boards were, um, were, were, were prioritising in terms of uh, the recruitment of, of uh, head teachers into that sector. So I I'd be interested to know whether and how how um, the, the way that the uh, amendment's been framed, uh, those issues have been, been picked up. I, I, I suspect it's possibly more to do with the, the ongoing consultation the government <coughs> secretary has referred to. Um, but I'd, uh, I'd be grateful for um, comments on both those two points. Thanks. Thank you very much. Can I call Chick Brody? Thank you. Good morning. Um, the point I'd like to make, I, I don't know if it can be enshrined in any way in, in the terminology of the, of the, the bill. But I would make an appeal that while we talk about the person appointing to head teachers and we look at what's happening in, in London and also what's happening in, in New York in the educational field, that it, a person that falls within the subsection that we're talking about um, has to achieve standards of education and training. There is one element which I say is, is not easy to define, and that's leadership. Uh, there's a very strong difference in my opinion between management and leadership and I think those schools that have demonstrated success and movement in the cities that I mentioned and no doubt elsewhere uh, have chosen people who have demonstrable leadership qualities uh, and uh, I'll leave it there Kimbina. Thank you very much. Can I call Mary Scanlon? Yes, I just wanted to um, uh, to be reasonable and to say thank you. Um, and that's for addressing the particular shortage uh, of teachers in Murray. There are particular circumstances there, given that we've got the RAF base at Lossy Mouse, we've got the Royal Engineers at Kinloss, and, uh, you know, at the moment, uh, or at least in recent times, Murray was short of 26 teachers. And in fact, some children had to be sent home last February when a, a bug was going around, teachers unwell, but they had to be sent home because, because there were no teachers to teach them. Uh, and at the same time, we had 12 qualified teachers in the English system who were spouses of the personnel at RAF Lossy Mouth and the Royal Engineers at Kinloss. And uh, I really don't mind putting on the record that I think the GTC were pretty intransigent. I think they could have been a bit more helpful. I think they could have been a bit more respectful uh, to these teachers. They were qualified. They were experienced. They are qualified. They are experienced teachers. I'm pleased to say that after quite a bit of campaigning, uh, and in fact having them in front of this committee, that they have finally moved, and I'm very pleased to see that. I think Scotland should be an open and welcoming place uh, to teachers, regardless of where they come from. And although they may not have experience in our curriculum for excellence, I think any good and professional teacher can pick that up very well. So really on behalf of the particular circumstances uh, in Murray, 
the provision for exemptions and exep uh, exceptions is welcome. Thank you very much. Can I call, <coughs> call Liz Smith? Um, uh, can I uh, reiterate, to, to put on record, uh, convener, that I am a member of the uh, GTCS and also I am a governor of two independent schools. Um, can I also thank the Cabinet Secretary for what I think has been considerable engagement since the problems were flagged up uh, at stage one. That is very welcome. Uh, and can I intimate also that I think nothing is more important than having head teachers in any school, in any sector, that are absolutely first class and properly trained. Uh, and I think that is one of the reasons why they uh, the new changes that are happening to the GTCS, I think, are very welcome indeed, not least for the um, issues that Mary Scanlon has just uh, raised. So I think the, the principle is laudable, uh, but I do think we have to be slightly careful about how we develop uh, any new qualification. I am grateful to the Cabinet Secretary acknowledging that she will uh, continue with engagement in that, because I, I don't actually think there is a significant pool of evidence to suggest that there are severe problems with uh, heads per se. There are problems in finding uh, heads in recruitment, but I don't actually think there's a, a significant amount of evidence that points to the fact that there is a, a problem um, of, of any considerable nature. Um, and I also think we have to be very careful that we don't diminish the pool uh, of people who are uh, indeed uh, with very specialist skills, particularly when it comes to some of the, sc the, the schools that deal uh, specifically with children that have very specialist uh, needs. So I'm grateful to the Cabinet Secretary, in particular for Amendment uh, 133, which I think goes a long way to addressing the concerns uh, of these schools and also of the independent sector, which, as it uh, turns out, uh, I don't think were really the focus uh, for the into headship qualification, which I think is the reason that they uh, weren't really consulted on this. Um, I think the Cabinet Secretary is right to be very cautious about the implications for the independent sector and their uh, autonomous uh, governing bodies. Um, I understand that SCIS has made very plain uh, to the Cabinet Secretary and indeed to the First Minister that their legal advice suggests that the bill proposals uh, as they stood without these amendments um, would have been open to legal challenge. So I'm very grateful uh, to the Cabinet Secretary for taking that on board. Uh, I think um, our education uh, sectors are increasingly diverse and I think we have to recognise that and anything that uh, uh, put them in a straitjacket I think would do serious damage. So um, i just leave that on record. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Liz. Um, can I call the Cabinet Secretary to wind up? I'll just be very brief, uh, Convener. I would like to thank Mrs Scanlon for uh, recognising uh, the work that was completed to find some practical solutions uh, for the situation in Murray. And it does show uh, what is possible. Um, and I would like to actually put in record my thanks to the GTCS. Um, but it does show what is possible, that we can maintain standards, uh, but also have some uh, sensible uh, fle fle flexibility. And I hope I've demonstrated to committee that uh, I am uh, committed on, a, on an ongoing basis to work with local authorities, independent schools, general teaching council uh, and universities uh, to ensure that in providing the qualification uh, that we get the, the absolute uh, detail right. In terms of Mr MacArthur's points uh, in relation to recruitment, uh, vacancies for head teacher posts uh, just now is sitting at around 3%. Uh, but we do recognise that around a third of those vacancies uh, rest on a handful of local authorities, primarily uh, in the northeast of Scotland, and that the, the vacancy issue is more acute uh, in some parts uh, than, than others. Um, this is a matter that I will continue to discuss um, with ADES, but also other organisations uh, like the Association of Heads and Deputies uh, for, for, for Scotland. We do have to recognise that Personally and professionally, being a head teacher is a demanding role. Uh, leadership uh, is an important uh, quality. It's central to the job um, of being a head teacher. Uh, and I do consider uh, the qualification to be more of a help uh, than a hindrance, but want to give committee uh, an absolute assurance that we'll continue to work with all concern to, to ensure that the, the detail is absolutely right. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Uh, the question is that Amendment 133 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? <clears throat> That's agreed. The question is that Sections 23 and 24 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendment 127 in the name of Alastair Allen, grouped with Amendment 128, Cabinet Secretary, to move Amendment 127 and speak to both amendments in the group? 
Convener, these amendments were lodged in Dr Allen's name because they principally uh, relate to Gaelic medium education. Uh, we are dealing with them today because they make amendments to Part 4 of the Bill. Section 77 gives ministers the power by regulations to alter the number of children specified uh, in the Bill as constituting the threshold which will determine whether or not there is a potential need for Gaelic medium primary education and therefore whether a local authority will come under a duty to proceed to a full assessment. Section 12.1 gives ministers the power by regulation to extend the application of Part 2 of the Bill to assessments of the need for Gaelic medium education at the level of early learning and childcare. On the introduction of the Bill, regulations under both Sections 7.7 and 12.1 were subject to negative procedure. However, in its report in June, the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee it recommended that these powers should be subject to affirmative procedure. We reflected on this recommendation and agreed to bring forward amendments to that effect. Uh, that is what Amendments 127 and 128 do. Uh, in addition, Amendment 127 leaves out the, the reference to the power under Section 13B of the Bill in consequence of Amendment 105, which leaves out Section 1 of the Bill, and Amendment 104, which instead inserts the duty regarding inequalities of outcome into the Standards in Scotland School, etc. Act 2000. So I move Amendment 127 and ask the Committee to support both Amendments 127 and 128 in the group. Uh, thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Any other members wish to contribute? No. Nope. Anything to add, Cabinet Secretary? No. Thank you very much. The question is that Amendment 127 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Can I call Amendment 134 in the name of Rhoda Grant, already debated with Amendment 132, Mark Griffin, to move or not move? That's not Amendment 128 in the name of Alastair Allen. Already debated with Amendment 127. Cabinet Secretary to move formally. The question is that Amendment 128 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that Section 25 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that Sections 26, 27 and 28 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're agreed. Uh, can I call amendments 129, 135, 136, 137, 138, 139, 173 and 174, all in the name of the Cabinet Secretary and all previously debated. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to move amendments 129, 135 to 139, 173 and 174 on block. Moved on block. Can I ask whether any member objects to a single question being put on amendments 129, 135 to 139, 173 and 174? You object. Okay, um, therefore we'll put them individually. Uh, uh, the question is that uh, uh, oh, amendment. No. I'll just no. I'll go through them individually. Uh, the question is that amendment one two nine be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That's agreed. The question is that amendment one three five be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. Agreed. Uh, that's agreed to. Uh, the question is that one amendment one three six be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. That's agreed. The question is that Amendment 137 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Agreed. The question is that Amendment 138 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that Amendment 139 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that Amendment 173 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? We're not agreed. Therefore, there will be a division. Will all those members who wish to support Amendment 173 please vote now? Thank you. Uh, those against? Thank you. The result of the division on Amendment 173, uh, seven votes in favour and two votes against Amendment 173 is agreed to. Um, the question is that Amendment 174 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. The question is that the long title be agreed to. Are we all agreed? Thank you very much. That ends stage two consideration of the bill and I will suspend briefly before the next item.
Our next item is to take evidence on the Adoption and Children Scotland Act 2007, Amendment of the Children Scotland Act 1995, Order 2016. And I can I welcome back Angela Constance, Cabinet Secretary for Education and Lifelong Learning, and her supporting officials. After we have taken evidence on the instrument, we will debate the motion in the name of the Cabinet Secretary at item 4. Officials, of course, are not permitted to contribute in that formal debate. Can I invite the Cabinet Secretary to make opening remarks? Thank you, Convener. I ask the Committee to recommend to Parliament that the Adoption and Children's Scotland Act 2007, Amendment of the Children's Scotland Act 1995, Order 2016, be approved. The order is necessary to clarify the Scottish Government's position that people who have had their parental responsibilities and rights removed other than by way of adoption or human fertilisation legislation are nevertheless still permitted to apply to the court for a contact order which would allow them to maintain personal relations and contact with a child that they are not living with. The Children's Scotland Act 1995 outlines the requirements necessary to apply for orders relating to parental responsibilities or rights. When it was enacted, this Act did not permit people whose parental responsibilities or rights had been removed by virtue of an adoption order or through human fertilisation legislation to apply for parental responsibilities or rights. Other people who had lost parental responsibilities of rights were entitled to apply for an order in relation to those responsibilities or rights, including a contact order. The Adoption and Children's Scotland Act 2007, however, eh, amended the Children's Scotland Act 1995, and the purpose of this amendment was to allow persons who had lost parental responsibilities or rights under an adoption order to apply for a contact order with the permission of the court. Unfortunately, in making this amendment, the wording of the amendment may have inadvertently affected the existing right of people who had their parental responsibilities and rights removed by some other means, for example, removed by the court to apply for a contact order. This was not the policy intention of section 107. The order currently before the committee amends section 113AB of the Children's Scotland Act 1995 by repealing the words other than a contact order. This makes it clear that people without parental responsibilities or rights who could apply for a contact order prior to the 2007 Act can still apply for a contact order. This means that any person who has lost their parental responsibilities or rights in relation to a child can apply for a contact order unless they have lost those rights under human fertilisation legislation. I therefore ask the committee to recommend to Parliament that the order be approved. Thank you very much, Cabinet Secretary. Um, can I invite members uh, to ask any questions? Any mem members got questions for the Cabinet Secretary at this stage? Oh. Okay, can I move then to item four? As indicated, we now move to the formal debate on the instrument. Um, I, I invite the Cabinet Secretary to speak to and move the motion. Um, I move the motion in my name, Convener. Any contributions from members at this stage? Okay, I'll therefore put the question. Uh, the question is that motion S4M14949 be agreed to. Are we all agreed? That's agreed. Thank you very much. The committee has previously agreed to take the next two items in public and therefore I close sorry, in private, in private, not in public. Next two items in private and therefore I close the meeting to the public.